the MCAT Cars Podcast, session number 64. The car section of the MCAT gives thousands of pre-meds nightmares every night. Whether you're an ESL student, lack confidence while reading, or a slow reader like me, Jack Weston and the medical school headquarters are here to help you score higher in every section so you can be confident you're ready to get the MCAT score of your dreams. Now, welcome to the MCAT Cars Podcast. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray. I'm so glad you've taken some time out of your day today to join myself and Jack Weston from jackweston.com. If you haven't listened to our other podcasts, go to premedpodcast.com. This week, we have another great passage in store for you today. And stay tuned for after this episode, we're going to talk all about how you can get some more help from Jack Weston. Jack Weston back for some more MCAT Cars podcast. I hope you're having a carific day today. (laughs) That was great. Yeah, I'm doing great, man. How are you? I am amazing. And I am even more excited. If if you're listening to this podcast for like the first time, you're like, who's Jack? Who's Ryan? I don't know these weirdos. Is this podcast any good? Jack, I want to read you. I don't think you've seen this uh, because you're not hip with the social media like I am. But I posted something about cars on Instagram and talked about the podcast, this podcast, And a student uh, wrote a comment on the post and said, this podcast, right? This MCAT Cars podcast changed the way I thought about the passages and questions. I went from a 124 to a 130 in cars. The techniques I learned from the MCAT Cars podcast transferred into every section. Amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. From a podcast. So... I'm excited. So thank you for being a partner with me in this podcast, impacting those people out there. And hopefully you listening to this realize that this is a very impactful podcast if you take the time to learn from it and actually do the work. You've been amazing, man. I mean, I I love working with you and I'm happy that we can help a lot of people out. Oh, we're going to hug it out, bro. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Uh, What do we have in store for us today? Uh, It's a historical passage. It's uh, it's one of those passages. Oh, those that are hard ones. If if you don't know the history, you may feel a little uncomfortable, but yeah. it really doesn't matter. You don't need to know the history to know a lot. I mean, you should know basic history. You should know about the wars of the U.S. Mm-hmm. You should know the you know when they happened, right? But other than that, you don't have to know a lot about the the past to do well on cars. All righty. That's what I like to hear. You don't have to know a lot to do well. All right. So reading here, first paragraph, no novel of the past century has had more influence than George Orwell's 1984. All right. So it looks like we have maybe the the author's opinion here on uh, what he or she thinks has been a, an influential podcast or podcast, <laughs> influential book. Um in the past century, George Orwell's 1984. Hey, who knows? He might have made a podcast if he was still around. Oh man, that would be amazing. All right, I've I've never read 1984, so I can't speak to the. Um, that's oh, that's perfect because this whole thing is about 1984. Alrighty. So let's see if you can figure it out without knowing anything about 84. 1984. All right. All right. Go ahead. The title, the adjectival form, adjectival form of the author's last name. The vocabulary of the all-powerful party that rules the superstate Oceania with the ideology of Ingsoc, doublethink, memory hole, unperson, thought crime, newspeak, thought police, room 101, big brother. They've all entered the English language as instantly recognizable signs of a nightmare future. Wow. All right. So... My, my, my takeaway of this is there's a lot of terms here, terms that I don't necessarily know, but it seems like the author is saying, Hey, these are all from the book or right. The author's last name. Uh, and they all are pretty recognizable in our, in our language. And they they point to not a good thing. Yeah. Excellent. That's it. So these are words that come from the book. Um, 
I, you know, they don't necessarily sound bad, but they give you an idea of what the book's about. Yeah. So good. Okay. It's almost impossible to talk about propaganda, surveillance, authoritarian politics, or perversions of truth without dropping a reference to 1984. So again, the author here just showing us how how widespread this book potentially has reached into our society. Right. And I mean, you get a lot of clues as to what it's about, right? It says in the previous sentence, nightmare future. So maybe yeah. it's a nightmare future. Um, and it has things to do with surveillance, surveillance, uh, propaganda, perversions, none of which is appealing, really. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Throughout the Cold War, the novel found avid underground readers beyond the Iron Curtain who wondered, how did he know? So, again, the Cold War, um, kind of a reference to that. And how did he know, I guess, is saying how, like, how did George Orwell know what the future was going to be like? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, good. So, but you, you, it doesn't matter if you know what that means. Yeah. You already have a good idea of what we're talking about. You, at this point, everyone should know that George Orwell wrote a book. And the book is about all these different things that were described. And it seems like the author finds it to be influential, right? Uh, I mean, that's literally what the four, the first sentence said, more influence. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that you should know. And after that, you know, the rest should explain itself. Okay. All right. Next paragraph. It was also assigned reading for several generations of American high school students. And so just pointing to how popular it was. Right. And I think most students who are listening to this podcast probably have heard of it. But again, you don't need to. Mm -hmm. I first encountered 1984 in 10th grade English class. So the author telling us when he or she was exposed to it. Orwell's novel was paired with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, whose hedonistic and pharmaceutical dystopia seemed more relevant to a California teenager in the 1970s than did the bleak sadism of Oceana. All right, so lots of big words there that I'm not really sure, but it looks like it's just comparing Orwell's novel with Huxley's novel. Excellent, excellent. You don't need to know what the heck they're talking about with this <laughs> hedonistic pharmaceutical dystopia. Right. I mean, if you've read Huxley's, then you'll probably know what, what this is, what's going on here, right? With the Brave New World. But you don't need to. You don't, as long as you know they're making a comparison, they're both kind of in the same category, then you're fine. All righty. I like it. I was too young and historically ignorant to understand where 1984 came from and exactly what it was warning against. So the author here just talking about, uh, his or her uh, experiences. Neither the book nor its author stuck with me, so it just wasn't memorable for them. In my 20s, I discovered Orwell's essays and nonfiction books and reread them so many times that my copies started to disintegrate, but I didn't go back to 1984. So the author pointing out that Orwell has other stuff that resonated more with, with them. Since high school, I'd lived through another decade of the 20th century, including the calendar year of the title, and I assumed I already knew the book. So it looks like this author lived through the 80s uh, after reading the book, uh, but didn't go back to it because they already knew the book. I was too familiar to revisit. So this paragraph's interesting. So it's it's obviously pointing out that it was very common for high school students. There was this other book that it's comparing to, although that was kind of confusing. Uh, and that Orwell has a bunch of other material as well. That's it. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they're also saying that it, it felt too familiar, right? So it, sound, it sounds like something that like, you know, you've already seen before. It's nothing new to you. Yeah. Oh, but actually, like if I... If I think about that too familiar again, right? So the book is about this dystopian kind of future. And in the 80s, right, we're going through the Cold War. The The author's living through it. Why would I want to read about it? This is, it's too familiar. Exactly. 
Yeah. So whether it's the other books, whether it's their experiences, it's uh, well, the point they're trying to make here or the author is trying to make is that it's not interesting to me. It's not, it's not like something that, that really captivated me. Uh huh. Okay. Whew. All right. Next paragraph. So when I recently read the novel again, I wasn't prepared for its power. All right. So the author saying that they obviously revisited it and it was impactful for them. Okay. So now, right, when they reread it or look at it, they're, they, they care a lot about it. Mm -hmm. You have to clear away what you think you know, all the terminology and iconography and cultural spinoffs to grasp the original genius and lasting greatness of 1984. So the author basically telling the reader how you have to read the book to, to really understand it. It's a, it is both a profound political essay and a shocking, heartbreaking work of art. So again, the, the author just pointing out how much they like it. And in the Trump era, it's a bestseller. So the author pointing out that uh, in Trump era, that people are, are buying the book and reading more about this dystopian future. Right. Now, the reference to Trump is is not something you're going to see on on cars. They're not going to refer to politics today. So you 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 can just, you know, look over that. But it is important to note that if you see an answer or choice that brings up something about Trump era unless they bring up like if, unless they are very clear on what they mean by this, you're not responsible for it. Would they so ever try just, to make like yeah. a comparison to say a, a what do you think the author's opinion is of Trump, right? Because the author here is obviously saying Trump era and this dystopian future book is a bestseller. Would you, would you, would it try to make comparisons to, to Trump and, and people are scared and so they want to read this dystopian future? They could do that. You never know what, what they're going to do, but they could definitely do that. I just don't think they're going to do it because there, okay. there are better implications, better assumptions that, that they can ask for okay. or about. Okay. So because this is a very minor point at the end of a paragraph they're, and they don't expand on it, they're probably not going to ask a question about it. And that, that's interesting because if you ever get a question that asks which of the following is not supported, usually it's the point that they make at the end of a paragraph where they don't expand on it. So if, if you're interested in understanding the pattern of the AAMC, and you get a question like that, you almost always see the right answer is something that they barely talked about and happened at the very end of a paragraph. Nice. They squeeze it in there and yeah. put it in your head, but don't really talk about it. Exactly. All right. Next paragraph. The Ministry of Truth, the biography of George Orwell's 1984, by the British music critic Dorian Linsky makes a rich and compelling case for the novel as a summation of Orwell's entire body of work and a master key to understanding the modern world. All right, so we have another book here, basically, the author is saying that it's, uh, this other book is, helps explain why it helps people understand the world and maybe why yeah, it's very a bestseller. Confusing. Right, a, a book about a book's author. <laughs> yeah. The book was published in 1949 when Orwell was dying of tuberculosis, but Linsky dates its bio biographical sources back more than a decade to Orwell's months in Spain as a volunteer on the Republican side of the country's civil war. Wow, I didn't know the book was that old. Um, all right, so really old book, Orwell's dying of TB, um, but, but the, the inspiration potentially from before then. His introduction to totalitarianism, totalitarianism came from Barcelona when agents of the Soviet Union created an elaborate lie to discredit Tratoskits uh, or something in the Spanish government as fascist spies. Um, all right. So just pointing out Orwell's kind of inspiration and potential exposure to where this book came from. And where did it come from? Spain, the Spanish yeah. Civil War. That's it. Great. You looked overlooked the details, right? Who cares? This this Trotskyist Spanish government. None of that really matters. Yeah, I should try to understand how it might have some relationship to the Soviet Union. But at the end of the day, it's the Spanish Civil War, right? Where Orwell might have started getting these ideas. 
Yeah. All right. Got it. Next paragraph. Left-wing journalists readily accepted the fabrication, useful as it was to the cause of communism. So I'm not sure what fabrication they're referring to. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this sentence is getting at. Okay, keep going. All right. You know, we we can expand on this, but at the at the end of the day, you already know what's going on. We're talking about Orwell, his history, yeah. how he was in some war, the Civil War. Is this changing that argument a lot? I don't think so. Unless mm. we see something come up that's obvious, I'd keep reading. Okay. Orwell didn't exposing the lie with eyewitness testimony and journalism that preceded his classic book, uh, Homage to Catalonia, and that made him a, a heretic on the left. Um, so, all right, so comparing this sentence to the, the first one, so left-wing journalists readily accepted the fabrication uh, mm -hmm. as, as the, to the cause of communism, Orwell didn't agree with that. So Orwell is not with the left-wing journalists. So. Exactly, because it says he's a heretic on the yeah. left. So heretic is someone who goes against established authority, essentially. Yeah, okay. Okay. He was stoical about the boredom and discomforts of trench warfare. He was shot in the neck and barely escaped Spain with his life, but he took the erasure of truth hard. So... um. Wow. So this is just, it, it seems to be just more of Orwell's experience. Uh, he was shot in the neck. He almost died. The erasure of truth hard. He took that hard. So it sounds like maybe Orwell thought things were being erased and he didn't like that. Exactly. Exactly. That, and that goes back to the first sentence. Again, we don't really care much about that sentence, but it does say that left wing journalists kind of accepted the fabrication, the lies, mm. right? And um, that was useful to communism. And he wasn't, he wasn't for that. He didn't like that. So he tried to establish the truths. And, and, you know, that's what it's trying to say. All righty. It threatened his sense of what makes us sane and life worth living. All right. So that erasure of truth is threatening his sense of what makes us sane. Good. History stopped in 1936. He later told his friend Arthur Kostler, who knew exactly what Orwell meant. So it looks like history stopped in 1936, meaning everything after that was lies. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, or was erased, right? The erasure of truth. After Spain, just about everything he wrote and read led to the creation of his final masterpiece. I'm assuming, yeah, 84, 1984 is his final masterpiece because he was dying. Um, okay. History stopped, Linsky writes. And 1984 began. All right. So this last one was just a lot of, uh, of what happened to Orwell, um, what he experienced and, and potentially where, where his head was for why 1984 was written. Great. So what's the big picture of this pa passage? Like, what do they want you to know? Um, so... They want us to know that 1984 was this apparently impactful book um, and that its creator, this its writer Orwell, um, wrote it based on his experiences with the Spanish Civil War. Exactly. Or at least it came from that, right? Yeah. It started from that and everything thereafter led to that. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And you, again, you don't have to know anything about Orwell or 1984, they explain everything you need to know here. So you'll be fine when you get the questions on this passage, you'll be okay. Yeah. So 1984, Great. sounds like I should uh, read that book, huh? <laughs> I think you like it, yeah. Oh, okay. man. I uh, I just added it to my cart in, uh, in Audible as we speak. I can multitask. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. I love Audible. Okay, very cool. So Seems pretty straightforward in terms of like questions that they potentially could ask. Um, I don't know. That's the scary yeah, one. This one seems a little bit more straightforward, and that's the one I, I'm always scared of, like harder questions. For this passage, what 
I'm afraid of for students is they get tied up on the details. They're they're worried about the Soviet Union, the homage, uh, amid, uh, I'm sorry, the homage to Catalonia. Um, you know, these things are not important uh, as long as you know. Oh yeah, this paragraph is just expanding on his experiences with the Civil War. You're fine. I, I see a lot of students get stuck on this last paragraph. And they're trying to understand every little detail here. <laughs> they're like, and wait, they're, was it the left yeah. side of the neck or the right side of the neck that he was shot on? And they're like, right. wait, is that yeah. going to affect his left arm or right arm? <laughs> right. And and that wastes so much time. And when you waste that much time, you can't get it back, especially yeah. on a time test as, you know, uh, like the MCAT where time is everything. It's It's very precious. So knowing when to go fast, when to go slow is very, very important. All right, there you have it. As I mentioned earlier, to get some more help from Jack Weston, he does have an MCAT cars course, which if you go to jackweston.com, you can check out his course by clicking on course and see what dates he has available, see what spots he has, or you can go to his trial sessions as well to really check it out and see what Jack's teaching style is and see how you can benefit from the course. The courses are kept small so that you get more personalized attention. If you are looking for a $100 off coupon, go to medicalschoolhq.net slash Jack Weston, all one word, medicalschoolhq.net slash Jack Weston to save $100 off of that MCAT Cars course. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on the MCAT Cars podcast. This is MedEd Media.